So here we are then, the end of another two and a half hour journey up into the heartlands of Cambridgeshire. Got 48 hours ahead of us on this little pit I've been fishing this spring. This is going to be the last trip to this particular pit. So, yeah, looking forward to it. And while we're up here, we're just going to have a little look back on the, the last 12 months. A real memorable bit of fishing for me. So, be a bit of a reflective period, really. Quite looking forward to it. As you can see, I've got the rods on the rest behind me, but they're not fishing. I've got the leaders just draped into the margins. I don't want to put the rods out today. It's crystal clear water. It's a small, intimate pit, so I don't want to be putting the fish on edge. So those rods will go out at twilight, and uh, this is a lovely, quiet little pit. Perfect for the spring. Not many anglers about, and it just so happens that this is exactly where I started this time last year. It's almost a year to the day that I first set foot up in the flatlands of Fenland, Cambridgeshire. A place that I've wanted to come for a number of years now. So totally different to the sort of wooded valleys and gentle rolling hills of Berkshire and Kent, my hometown, my home county. Um, you know, like a wilderness, a, a wild place. Something with a sense of adventure to it again. It was, it was really somewhere that I couldn't wait to come and explore and it had that sense of wild spirit about it as such, you know. The fish have always seeded themselves around this county, like, you know, with the, the flooding of the, the great ooze, um, you know, water flowing through the reserves and spreading the fish around. You never knew where they were going to be, what was happening. Um, it, it just had that sense of I don't know, mystery about it, I suppose. It was a, it was a really exciting place to, to come to and, and somewhere that I'd, I'd never really explored before. So that, that's what motivates and drives you to, to make those journeys, you know, across the busy motorways of Kent, the, some of the busiest motorways in, in England, if you like. And, uh, you know, those two or three hour journeys, um, I knew I was going to spend thinking and plotting and scheming about my, my angling in the area. And, uh, you know, there was, there was one place particularly in mind that I had, uh, and that was a, 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 a huge pit just outside of Cambridge itself, a pit named Ferry Lagoon. A big air of mystery around the place. Loads of history in the past. But that's all changed. Like the floods of 2012 pretty much decimated the area and fish went here, there and everywhere. Um, but that added to the sense of mystery, that, 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 that wild, brutal nature that sweeps through this sort of area. That, that's why I've come here. That's why, that's exactly the reason why I wanted to fish this sort of, uh, this sort of area. 
Um, that sense of the unknown, not knowing exactly what was there and what wasn't. And Ferry was just that, you know, you just didn't know what was there. Great big sheet of water that was, you know, pretty much open to the elements, prone to flooding, right next to the great ooze. And that first trip, that first trip just after the Easter bank holidays, that was exactly what we were, um, we were faced with, a massive flood. The ooze had broke its banks and the whole area was underwater. It was, you know, it, it was radical. I remember traveling down the track towards the complex and just seeing this water cascading out of the, the reserves over the main road and flying into ferries, just this foaming chocolate brown surge of water. Uh, you know, it was radical. Couldn't believe it, but I'd, I'd driven all that way. I, was, I, I wasn't gonna get there and not fish. So I got on the phone to my mate Si, who was already up the other end on some high ground. And, uh, you know, got fishing for that first night. But as is the way, we, we were flooded off the first night, moved, got to some more high ground. And yeah, the second night, exactly the same thing happened. Those water levels were just rising rapidly. All the relief channels were full, all the drainage ditches were full, and a great big sheet of water was just filling up as you know, before your very eyes. And that, that early that morning, chest waders on, had to wade back to the van, all the gear in the back, got our way off the complex, and um, yeah, we ended up sort of reconvening in a drive-by McDonald's on the A14 and, and just look back upon that session, that, that, that first trip. Incredible, brutal conditions, an incredible pit, but you couldn't even see the perimeter at the end. It was just, ev everything was flood water, all the meadows, it was unrecognisable. Incredible, incredible place, wild, exactly the reason that I'd gone there in the first place. So with Ferry flooded and the complex closed, I needed somewhere else up in the area, up in the zone if you like, to, to come and, I, I wanted to keep my eye on Ferry, but I needed somewhere else to fish. And I found this little place, quite small and intimate. Heard it had got a lovely stock of really, really special old carp. A few big ones, a few nice old scaly ones. And it was just the perfect place to be able to drop on it, it's further up into Cambridge, right in the heart of the Fenlands. So the next week, I made my way up here and uh, it was late, I got here late. There wasn't a lot of, of daylight left, maybe three quarters of an hour. And I made my way around the lake and there was a big northwesterly blowing, it's freezing cold. Big rollers coming over the lake, foam in, in the margins and what have you. And immediately for me, it was like, I'll try and get on the back of this wind unless I see something. But I was against time, so I'd had a quick scout up and down. And in the failing light, I saw a tent show, sort of on the wind line, about halfway across the pit. Well, that was a start. And then I got my gear into position, and just before dark, I saw a fish, a definite carp, you know, big black shape come up through the waves, like that. And I thought, well, we're on, we're on something here. Little bit of leading around and I uh, found a nice clear area about 70 yards out. Got three rigs out there, a little bit of bait, got my shelter up, and I basically spent the rest of the evening sort of sheltering from the wind. It was freezing cold, I had all my, wi had all my winter gear on. Like, you know, hat, big, big coat and what have you, got my cooker going, and, uh, but I felt it, it felt good. I was tucked away under this big bit of bank, and um, yeah, it was lovely, it's quite quite comfortable. And I was, I was up in the fens. It was, the adventure was continuing. Next morning, just after first light, left hand rods absolutely ripped off. Bent into it, nice fight, got deep water in front of me. You're looking at maybe sort of 12 foot. And uh, as this wind's howling over my shoulder in the waves, I could see the line slicing through just as daylight came. And, this fish has topped in the waves. I could see it was a long, a long mirror. 
And the first time he rolled in front of me, I just saw this big linear plate, line of plates down its flank. Incredible looking carp. And uh, what a way to start. Anyway, in the net she went. And I've looked down and it was a wide fish, big head on, big sloping head, big overslung mouth. And a, and a bit of a, you know, as I looked into the net, she had a bit of a, a chopped tail sort of thing. It all healed up and what have you, but um, very distinctive fish. Incredible skin patination, great big apple slice scales in a beautiful linear line down the flanks and loads of little pearly scales around the tail. Um, just an, an amazing fish in, in immaculate spring colours, great condition after the winter, plump, everything, could, everything was absolutely perfect. What a start, what a Fenland start, blew me away. So we've had the rods in all afternoon. Time's getting on a bit now. So I'm just gonna clip these rigs on, get all three rods out over the zone. And I'm just gonna flick a few baits out with a throwing stick. And we're settled for the night. Biggest part of my angling really is observation, watching the water at all times of the day and night. One of the things that just gives the game away is location, it's watercraft, watching those signs, seeing the, the signs, letting the fish tell you what's happening and then understanding it and, and reacting to it. Such an important part of my angling. In fact, probably the most important part. Well, we had a bit of action last night, but unfortunately it weren't from the carp. First take came, I think it was about half past nine, and it was a tench on the left hand rod. So I got that back out onto the spot quite sweet and stayed up quite late into the night having a listen. It was a bit windy, uh, but there was always a chance of hearing something. Ended up going to bed and I think it was around quarter past two, had another tench on the middle rod, repositioned it, and a third bite resulted in another ten. That was about quarter past four. I didn't put that rod back out at that time of the morning. Didn't want to be thumping a four ounce lead in onto the zone at what I considered to be around sort of bite time for this lake. So I left it out of the equation and he's still sat up against that bush. I've seen a fish this morning, showed about 15 metres past the zone, but that's the one and only carp I've seen. So gonna have a little look round this afternoon, maybe have a little move, we'll see. Depends what we see this afternoon, but I'm gonna have a little mooch and make a decision, maybe move before evening. We'll see how it goes.
So in the weeks following the capture of the little pit linear up in the fens, I was scrutinising the weather, waiting for my return to ferry, waiting for that right moment. It happened within a couple of weeks and I noticed on the forecast a period of settled sunny weather coming. It was the first really warm period of springtime weather. Temperatures were due to hit sort of 18 degrees. I knew it was time to get back. I remember driving up to that, that complex with a, like, a real sense of excitement and anticipation, if you like, you know, remembering those, those flood waters and how raw that lake had looked on the last visit when we got flooded off. Just wanted to see how things had changed. I remember driving in there and the flood waters had subsided a little bit. But as I looked over that vast expanse of water, I just realised, you know, this was going to be the start of probably the most physically demanding and challenging period of fishing that I'd ever undertaken. And that was just how it panned out over those next few months. I remember turning up for that, that second session, pulling into the car park and looking out across the lake. There's a gentle southeasterly wind blowing. It's a warm wind, very gentle. There's a lot of flat calm. And I knew this was going to be a good day for looking. So whacked on the old chest waders and uh, started on my first lap. Now, you're talking about a, a big perimeter of the, of, of the lake itself. And a lot of it was still under flood water. So it was hard work getting around. But I was determined to find the fish. You can't, you can't look at a sheet of water like that uh, and just make a, 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 an educated guess. You've got to go and find them. And that was what I planned to do. By mid-afternoon, I'd found nothing, and it felt like I was on a lo losing battle, really. But right at the last minute, I was on my, my third lap of the lake, probably walked maybe seven or eight miles at this point, and I saw a flat spot just off the back of the wind, and a dorsal just poked out in the chop. I'd found one. I remember running round an out-of-bounds area and onto a long point, I knew these fish were coming across the wind to a bay and I can just remember standing on the end of this point and two fish just cruised past into a bay. So exciting, you know, finding a couple of fish on a water, and a body of water that size, that's what it was all about. That, that was the secret, that was the key. I remember them visiting this bay and, and I watched them, videoed them actually, and they've turned around and made a, a rapid exit out of this uh, out of this area and out into the main body of the lake, but it was enough. I went and got my gear and set up on the point, fanned the rods out over the area, covering as much water as I could. And uh, that was my first night back on ferry, super excited. I can remember waking up in the morning, facing the dawn, the rising sun, the whole sky lit up orange and this great big ball of fire rising up over the far islands. An incredible sight, you know, and, and the perfect sort of return to ferry, give you that inspiration, you know, that hope that you were going to see one come up at clattering out of the water at 300 yards or hopefully closer so that you were in, in with a chance. Uh, but I remember that morning coming and going and, and seeing absolutely nothing, despite it being a flat calm morning. And, and that was to be pretty much the way things went for the next couple of months. Incredibly elusive carp. I can remember, you know, leaving home two o'clock in the morning to get to get to ferry for first light, watching those beautiful Fenland sunrises, mist coming up off the water, you know, unveiling the, the flat calm surface of the lake, you know, you were looking for any signs, bubbles, the odd show, and, and as time went by, just became really, really quickly apparent that these fish weren't going to give themselves up very, very easily at all. And for the best part of those first couple of months leading into the summer, pretty much fishing blind. You know, I had a few good friends up uh, on the lake at the time and, and between us, we used to share little snippets of information, whatever we could gather. And between all of us, you know, there, there really was only a couple of sightings and the groups of fish that were seen were, were very small very, very elusive, very natural fish. It was obvious that by now they were either spending a lot of time in the out of bounds or they were out of sight for, for much of the time. I used to spend a great deal of the night sitting up. 
hoping to, you know, in that vain hope of hearing them clatter out in the dark hours. And, uh, you know, early rises, a lot of effort, a lot of walking. And by mid-June, God knows how many miles I'd covered around that lake, but it, you know, it was a lot. Just trying to hunt down, trying to track down these carp was a mission in itself. And obviously because of that, most of the nights you were, you'd spent fishing blind really, you know, it was, it was educated guesses, fishing on the wind, fishing off the wind, fishing in the corners that the, the little bit of flood water was still trickling in, trying to find those first beds of weed that, you know, held that, that first signs of natural life. We, we were left with a lot of doubts, um, you know, just because of the limited number of fish we were finding. It was incredibly hard to find them, and every sighting was, was very, very special. And we lived for those moments, you know, but they were few and far between. And as the sort of spring turned slowly into summer, I can remember waiting and looking for those really hot, long spells of weather, thinking that it would be the perfect opportunity to get up there and maybe find them gathering for spawning. But, you know, it, it just wasn't to be. And we were very, very soon approaching a time when I was about to move house. And I knew that Ferry would have to take a back seat for a period of time, which, you know, I was gutted about. But on the positive side of that, I had a, a, a local lake that I still had a ticket for. And I'd fished it a fair bit on and off in the past and caught a couple of the real key mirrors. But there was one big common that had eluded me. And uh, I, I was about to, uh, to make a return and whilst I was in that process of moving house, I was going to do a little bit of a, a campaign on that local water and see if I couldn't put the old swirly back common in the net. There's actually no more important time in the, of the year than the spring for moving about the lake. The carp have just woken up, they're getting around every area, they're exploring every avenue, looking for all the new areas, they're looking for warmth. You have to be mobile, you have to be prepared to move day or night onto shows or onto anything that you discover. It's proven most important to me uh, over all my spring fishing, let alone this particular spring when most of my captures have come from quick moves and moves very often late in the evening um, on those last light shows. So there is no more important time to be getting about the lake than in the spring. Right, so we've moved. Come right round the other side of the lake. Opposite, we're now in the lee of the wind. Lovely sun trap. Got a beautiful calm margin up to the left and the right. Classic sort of springtime area, really. It's actually, it's actually the swim that I caught the 34 linear from last year. So I know the swim quite well, to be fair. And as it happened, last week, I dropped into this swim on the strength of a show. I managed to catch a nice mid-20 common the following morning, right over the top of the silkweed. It's almost like they're, they're in that silkweed for the, the early crustaceans and food source. So we're going to get the rods flicked out. I know the spots. It's going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to flick a few baits out with a stick again this evening and see what the night brings.
spring for me isn't really about baiting as such. It's more about just giving them little bits and pieces to look at. They're not really hitting the spots like they would be later on in the year. So one of my main things in the spring is mobility and my baiting is all revolves around that. So a lot of it will be just putting a little bit out at last light. I always leave it till last light just in case I'm gonna move, but I like a few bits and pieces out there through the night for them to pick up, but I scatter it far and wide. I'm not concentrating my bait into little tight zones or, or whatever, that's for later on in the year. Spring is all about the fish moving and grazing, and I need to be able to react to that. I need to be able to move my rods around areas of the swim or areas of the lake. And my sort of scattered baiting approach works perfectly in those sort of scenarios. Certainly for me in the spring, that's the way forward. So by early July, I was starting to think about fishing closer to home. I had the big move, the big house move coming up, and I knew it was my time to get back on the Milton complex, Milton Pan to be precise, in search of Old Swirly, a real old Kent history fish and one that I'd looked at since the sort of mid 90s and you know, right on my radar. I'd sort of done a few recce trips in the spring, given them a bit of food, managed to actually see Swirly on one occasion. And soon after starting back, I managed to see her again coming out of a really weedy corner. And that was the, the start of it for me. I found a small bar, a sandbar out in the pond, right next to where they were sort of holding up over this period of time. And I started baiting it and decided that rather than fish long sessions, because I was closer to home, could break everything up into sort of one-nighters, have a little break, give them a bit of food, let them have a bit of uh, you know, freedom on the area and then go back and do another quick night. And the whole period was leading up to a, a new moon phase. I had this two week period to fish and those overnighters started to pay off. In fact, the first one, uh, I ended up catching three fish on the first morning, a lovely scaly, fully scaled, um, beautiful carp, quite a rare capture from the pit as it goes. And uh, another one, a, a really long old male fish that I'd seen hanging around with that swirly in that weedy corner. So, you know, it felt like I was close. A Couple of nights later, I dropped back in after giving them a big hit of bait, a couple of big buckets, you know, a uh, bit of particle and a lot of boilie, a lot of fish meal boilie, the krill. And uh, yeah, it was plainly obvious they were eating it because the following morning, yet again, a uh, couple of takes uh, off the area uh, and another nice couple of mirrors. So you'd imagine my confidence was right up there. Unfortunately, on the third overnighter, I lost one in the morning. Got a take on a, on a tight clutch and braided line, actually cut into the black back plate of my Neville. And uh, on picking the rod up and freeing the line, um, at, you know, unfortunately the hook bumped. Uh, and that was take six. The following week I was back on the session leading up to the new moon and after baiting up on the first morning, I left the lines out of the water and uh, I got them in later on that evening. And uh, nothing happened that first night, but I did get a few liners in the morning. <clears throat> and Swirly was plainly on show where I'd been seeing her in this weedy corner. So I knew things were, were looking up. That evening, a good friend of mine, Si, came and had a few cups of tea with me, had a bit of a social and the bike came right on the peak of that new moon. I've done the waders, got in, waded out into the water past the willow, played her in up to the marginal shelf, and uh, a big old common rolled on the surface, clearly swirly. My heart was in my mouth, played her up and down in the deep water. She was lunging about, a really old fish. Eventually she rolled in the net. Absolutely perfect ending, lucky number seven. And, uh, 42 pound four, what an incredible end to that little campaign. You know, I've been after her for a fair while on and off and um, you know, this was the, the, the perfect antidote to all the harsh fishing that I'd sort of experienced over the past few months. Uh, and it was gonna give me that injection of, you know, re a real boost, if you like, to me angling and I couldn't wait to get back to Ferry at this point. But with old Swirly in the net, you know, such a lovely old carp, queen of the Stour Valley, if you like, lovely old scallops, pecks, and you know, an ancient old Kent history fish. So, you know, it was time for a celebration. And um, we had that celebration. 
And then after that, all my whole focus of attention was just to get back up ferry and get hunting for these carp. So it was still blisteringly hot, red hot, but you know, I was on fire, inspired and ready to take on that beast, that ferry lagoon again. I couldn't wait to get back up there, if I'm honest. And uh, look at, looking at the weather for that following week, it just happened to coincide with a, a brand new wind direction. And, and that wind direction was blowing up to a, a little sort of bay right on the edge of the outer bounds. In the middle of this bay was a big shallow plateau covered in weed. And it was an area that we'd only just been allowed to fish. It, because of the sort of, um, you know, the RSPB, it's a sensitive area for nesting birds. You were only allowed in this zone for a brief period of time from the summer to the early autumn. And uh, it, it was open and I knew exactly where I wanted to head. I got up ferry, I left home at two o'clock in the morning, got up there for first light. And the, and the first place I wanted to look was up in this bay. So I made my way round there. And um, I think I've been probably stood there for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour looking. And I was quite shocked by this point at just how much the weed had come up on the lake. You know, after that big flood water had scoured all the bottom off and risen the, the, uh, the levels and what have you, it had taken forever for the weed to take a hold. But those few weeks that I've been away, Matt, it hit the surface over a big area of the lake. And it just so happened that this particular part of the bank, it, it looked like the weediest bit of the lake. So it's where I wanted to focus my attention for the morning. Well, I think I'd only been stood there for maybe best part of half an hour. And uh, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black shape slide up between two weed beds. Focused my vision on it, and sure enough, it, it was a carp. Like, big set of rings coming out of the area, like light, gentle southeasterly breeze just pushing in there and uh, just taking those ripples away. Like the excitement that rose inside me, that you know, the hunter instinct was, was incredible. I just couldn't believe it. You know, I was, I was obviously on a high anyway from the, the previous few weeks fishing and to see one so quickly, having seen so few fish over the past few months on the lake, what a boost to the, to the morale and the confidence. It was incredible. Anyway, by the afternoon, I was sort of settled and I'd had a small lead around. The fish had stopped showing. Uh, there was no visible signs of them at this point. So I had a little lead around. As I say, it was a new area. It was unfamiliar ground. But I soon found a few nice drops around the weed beds, got the rods in position. It was a bright, warm day with this lovely wind trickling in. As it flattened off uh, in the early part of the evening, I was sitting there eating my dinner and <laughs> one's crashed out on top of this plateau. I just can't tell you how, what an electric feeling that is. These wild carp you've been trying to track down for months and all of a sudden they're there in front of you, you know, it's, it's game on. Nothing more exciting than that. It was a real, like, incredible moment. And, like, one of the best things about that lake is, you know, for the sheer size of it and the sheer volume of, of water there, you know, there was two of us on the lake. You know, incredible, such a... Uh, you know, such, such solitude um, for such an incredible environment. Um, you know, it really was something special. And obviously that night, you know, I couldn't sleep. You know, I was, I was listening for them, walking the banks up and down. I, wanted, I didn't want to miss a thing, not a single thing. But by the morning, it seemed like they'd vacated the area. Just as I was about to pack up, I had a phone call and it sort of held me up a little bit. And I was really glad that it did because for those, over the course of those next few hours, although I wouldn't know it yet, I saw the biggest display of ferry carp that I was to see the whole season. The fish moved over on this uh, shallow plateau. I'll sort of explain it. It was, it was a big shallow area that rose up out of deep water and, and right on top of it, there was, there was some old dead trees, like old stumps and twigs. Where the wind had been pushing in it, they'd caught up all these long strands of weed, a lot of eel grass and ripped up Canadian and what have you. And, uh, I can only think at the time that the fish were taking the snails from underneath the weed. Because every now and again I'd see a gentle swirl and a little dorsal would pick up. And then you'd see a little tail pattern and then a back would bob out. you see this big dark back. But I will say, um, unfortunately, the RSPB had cut down all the trees in the area to allow these ground nesting birds to, to use the zone. So there, there was no sort of, there was no elevated position to be able to get up and see exactly how many were there or what was there. But that, in a way that was part of the, 
that was part of the mystery of ferry. That was part of the appeal. You know, back in time, you had fish like the, the big ferry linear, you know, a, a big 50 pound Fenland carp, the wall pack fish, um, you know, an upper 40, a, a, a big long list of, of fantastic, of great historic carp that had come through on this lake. And you never knew what was left. Some had come, some had gone. They'd lost a lot in the floods, but more had come. So the appeal was that you just didn't know. And that was, that was the exciting thing. And there was this big one called Black Spot and he'd, he'd ended up in Ferry. Uh, on, he'd had a bit of a journey. So in the, in the floods of 2012, he'd ended up, he was a fen fish and he'd, he'd gone out on the floods I think he'd ended up in Farfen, and then eventually, at some point later, he ended up in Ferry Lagoon. Big, chunky, dark grey, wrinkly old fish with a great big scale. He was one of the old, one of the old school Fenland carp, you know, a real special one. And his last few captures, he was like an, an upper 40. He was just under the 50 pound mark. So, as you can imagine, a, a real target and one that I'd love to have clapped my eyes on on my time on the lake, but. You know, it just, it wasn't to be. And, uh, you know, is he still there? We don't know. That's, again, that's all part of the mystery and all part of the, the beauty of these sort of waters. But that, yeah, that hot day on that plateau, you know, there was a gathering of carp and it was an incredibly exciting period of time. Obviously, I had to go home. I give them some bait in the area. I used the, the last few hours to find uh, a few spots further down the bank, up against some of the big expansive weed beds that was stretching out into the lake. And I knew that I was probably gonna use that as a bit of a base over the coming months, you know, the summer months. The weed beds were there, the fish had obviously visited that area. And if I couldn't find them elsewhere on the pit, it sort of gave me a little bit of a starting point at the beginning of my trips, somewhere to go if you like, um, while I was looking around over the subsequent days. But, you know, cut a long story short, those, those following few months through that hot weather of July and August, those old carp just became elusive again. Um, and, and by the end of the summer, of course, you know, my, my main sort of source of hope really was the drop in weed, the drop in the natural food chain, and those big winds of autumn, you know, the, the change in the environment and everything starts going the other way. And if you can track them down and, and find them in the deeper water somewhere and give them a bit of food, there was always that hope of a, of a, of a big autumn whacker from, from ferry. But what I didn't hope for was uh, once those big weed beds started breaking up, they caused all sorts of carnage. And uh, all my carefully prepped areas, you know, maybe you could fish them for 24 hours and all of a sudden, you know, the wind would change direction, it would change to a quarter and uh, a, a 300 yard weed bed would break away and come sweeping round, wiping all your rods out. All manner of carnage on the big winds. And of course, when you're talking about flat landscapes and big winds and big sheets of water, you know, you're talking about monster waves and a lot of turbulence, a lot of back head ears, a lot of undertow. Um, it, it was absolutely brutal fishing. Um, you know, test me, like I said earlier on, it was a, it was a real battle of, of resolve in the end, you know. It was me against the carp, me against the elements. A lot of the anglers had dropped away by this point. It was ever so quiet. You didn't quite have the same amount of information sharing going on. So going into autumn, um, you know, I just relied on what I'd seen over the course of the year and, and a bit of watercraft, really, um, where I thought they might turn up. And I baited a couple of, of deep corners. And I remember going into that sort of, uh, that period of time, um, after raking huge areas of weed from the margins just to be able to get the rods into position, you know, hours and hours of work with a big rope and a chain and a rake, um, just to clear a zone to get the lines in. I turned back up to one of these, one of these plots and, uh, and that afternoon, bosh, out in the middle of the bay, right on the back of the wind, one of the ferry carp showed himself. And, uh, and that gave me the inspiration to carry on. And I was gonna do that sort of, uh, that late autumn period, balls out on ferry, give it my all, and, uh, and see what came of it. 
but those winds, they just, they just battered me. Uh, and I can remember, you know, come sort of late October, early November into fireworks night, really, really good period for, for those big uns. You know, my, my sort of confidence levels were just starting to wane at that point. And, um, you know, the actual, the, the, the journeys to ferry were becoming longer, the nights were darker, longer hours of darkness, of staying up late at night. And, um, you know, it was starting to take its toll. And I knew then that, that the thought of doing the winter on a lake like ferry just wasn't the one for me. Not traveling, you know, doing two and a half hours of, uh, of motorway driving. And, uh, you know, it got to that, that last sort of trip I remember looking over that that vast landscape, those big areas of uh, of windswept water. All the leaves were off the trees. Weed beds had sunk, and I just thought, you know, th this is it. This is probably going to be my last trip, and uh, those ferry carp are going to have to wait. They'd won that year, I think. Looking back on it, there'd been two bites out of the whole syndicate, and both fish had been lost. Um, as far as we knew, there hadn't been a single carp put on the bank, but nevertheless, we'd seen them and we knew they were there. It was just incredibly natural carp in a very wild environment with a lot of natural food and a lot of places to hide. And, and that's what you're up against, but that's the reason you go to a lake like Ferry. Absolutely mind blowing. <music> Well, as you can hear, the old uh, speedboat's still charging up and down on the pit next door. But I'm done for the night. The sun's gone down, rods are out, put a bit of bait out with a stick, and uh, that's, that's about all I can do. You know, we've seen one fish this morning, but we've moved around in the lee of the wind. You can see the wind's just starting to drop off now. Um, it's going to be a cold night, clear skies. So, yeah, we've pretty much you know, or I've done all I can now. Uh, it's, it's down to the down to the carp gods now to to shine down on me and maybe uh, give me a chance. But yeah, even so, we're out in beautiful early spring weather, so you can't ask a lot more than that. Really enjoyed myself today. As well as being one of the most productive times of the year, spring can also be a really cruel mistress. And this trip has just happened to be very weather dependent. We've had a really brisk northeasterly wind whipping across the surface of the lake for the whole period of time we've been here. Apart from last night when it flattened off, the skies cleared, those temperatures dropped and we had a heavy ground frost. Dropped to about minus one last night by 10 o'clock. Things were looking rather bleak and we woke up this morning and nothing really happened and I haven't seen anything this morning so it looks like you know it looks like we're going to probably end up with a blank trip but in retrospect looking back on the the last few weeks since I started coming up here in March and I've had a really really good spring and a lot of great memories to take away with me it all started on the first trip back after a long winter away I was eager to get back up here and it, it coincided with some big winds. And that first trip, I ended up fishing two different swims at two completely opposite ends of the lake. Although I saw a few fish that trip, no bites occurred, but I worked out a little bit of a pattern of what they were doing. And I decided to in introduce just a little bit of bait to a couple of areas, just to give me something to look at when I came back the following week. On the return on that trip, I, I decided to fish a really shallow area of the pit, looking out onto the area that I'd baited that previous Friday. And that proved to be a, a, a right result. Throughout the day, it was a sunny day, but I hadn't seen much in the way of carp action. And as evening drew on, I suddenly saw a fish show over that baited area. Quickly packed all my kit up, got round to the other side of the lake, and 
I got my rods in onto that area for the night, just in the nick of time, just as the light was failing. Now, we were forecast a, a really big bout of heavy weather coming in. Huge Atlantic storm front was pushing in and the weather was due to go really carpy. I'm talking big winds, a massive pressure drop. I think from memory it was like 992 with 50 to 60 mile an hour gusts. So you can imagine I was sat there rubbing my hands together, but I'd made sure I pushed those bivy pegs in for the night. In the early hours of the morning, I had the first bite. Just as light was coming through at dawn, I was playing this fish. You could see it rolled in the, the swell and it was a good common, big wide common, dark colors, real, real pucker spring fish. Put it in the net and I realized that I'd got probably my first 30 pounder of the spring. Bagged it up and got the rod back out in these wild conditions. Managed to just about film a drop. And it was about maybe half an hour later that that same rod went off again and uh, lovely dark chestnut scaly mid 20 mirror rolled into the net. And that was the first morning done. I got the photographs done and uh, obviously I was keen to get the rods back into position as the, the second night, the wind was due to get even stronger, 60 mile an hour plus gusts. And uh, I was in the teeth of the wind at this point as well. Like it, the, the wind had swung a quarter, it was blowing a, a straight southwest right into my face. So uh, as you can imagine, it was batting down the hatches time and uh, get those rods sorted before that wild weather came sweeping in across the flatlands of the fens. I got myself all tucked up as comfortable as possible, ready for the night ahead. And when the rain came in, I battened down the hatches, zipped the door up and made myself a few cups of tea and my food for the night. I wasn't expecting any action until probably the early hours of the morning or just before first light. So when the rod ripped off at 11 o'clock in the pouring rain and the, what felt like possibly the eye of the storm, it was quite a bit of a surprise. On picking the rod out, it was nearly wrenched out of my hand and uh, you know, this. The, the battle ensued sort of thing. And by the time I got the fish swirling around in the swell towards the bank, I went to pick my net up. And in the severity of the wind, it was actually ripped out of my hand, ended up in the lake down the margins. Fortunately, I had the sort of wits about me at that time of the night to be able to get my foot onto the, the handle of the net and trap it before it got whisked off down into the, the margins and left me in a bit of a predicament. I netted the fish and it was one of the, it was like a, a low double common, probably Probably a fish sort of grown on in the lake, you know, maybe from one, one of the early spawning periods, but he was a little fella and in the, in the conditions that were, were sort of around me, I decided just to take a quick snap of him on the mat and slip him back. I got that rod back out and uh, just before dawn broke, that same rod was away again. Pulled into a heavy, slow moving fish, kited slowly to my right. And uh, you know, it was, to be fair, it was like really hard to keep contact a lot of the time, such was the severity of the weather. Um, I just knew it was a much better fish. Eventually I started drawing it up the margins. And, uh, and by this point, I just had enough light and I glimpsed a, a set of linear line scales and I knew it was a special one. Eventually through the, through the sort of the waves and the white capping and, and the, the turbulence of the water, she, she rolled into the net and as I peered in, I could see it, it clearly was one of the real jewels of the lake. A beautiful scattered broken linear, great big apple slice scales and loads of little petal scales all scattered across her belly, big dark chestnut back and creamy flanks. An incredible looking carp and one that I was absolutely blown away by on that spring morning. It was one of those fish that just makes you spring. You know, it's it, all, all the traveling and the, the anticipation through winter, that, that's what you came for. That was what it was all about. And in the most epic conditions that you can imagine, exactly what makes you, you, you feel alive. We got that fish out at breakfast time. And by this time, I think it was at the peak, the peak of the storm, 60 mile an hour gusts, and probably two foot waves rolling down the length of the pit, foaming up in the margins. My rods were wiped out at this point. I'd, I'd actually finished fishing. Uh, there was reed stems, Norfolk reeds just bound up in all my braid and just ended up getting the rods out of the equation. It, it, it was over, but I had this incredibly special fish to photograph and I just, I just remember carrying her back into the, into the water at that time and 
bearing in mind only a few months previously I'd broken my leg. You know, this, this was like epic conditions and I, all that was forgotten. All I wanted to do was get the fish back in the water and, and experience that movement, that swell. And I remember as I lowered her in, these, these waves just come crashing over my shoulder, spraying my face and, uh, and looking down, watching this fish go back. And, and as she's twisted away from me, I distinctly remember her putting her dorsal up and she's powered away and with a big whip of the tail, just sprayed up a load of water and it was like, that is what spring carp angling is all about.